Here we are, Lord. Send us and make us your fishers of people. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Raise your hand if you knew this was the annual meeting today and came to church anyway. All right. Very good. I think that says something, right, about who we are and who we strive to be. For those of you who are new, a brief word about what we're doing today. The Episcopal Church, uh, in our very constitution and canons, the way that we are made up, we are a democratic church. And so your priests and rectors are not appointed. They are uh, elected by local congregations. Our bishops are not appointed. They are elected. Everything that happens in the life of the Episcopal Church happens because at some local community somewhere, uh, that effort was raised up and lifted. So we take our part in the workings of the larger Episcopal Church here this morning. It is a great privilege to be able to do so. Welcome to the 173rd annual meeting of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Brookline and my 13th annual address as your rector. I, <laughs> well, wait, let's see what I have to say first. A few weeks ago, I was talking with clergy colleagues of mine who are rectors of their parishes about all of our upcoming annual meetings and how we were all in the midst of writing our annual reports. One of my colleagues commented that she wished she could submit the following as hers. Rector's report for 2021. It was really, really, really hard. <laughs> Respectfully submitted, your rector. 2021 was really, really, really hard. And it was hard in lots of different kinds of ways. Of course, the pandemic of COVID-19 continued, and not only did it continue, but it moved into grayer, more difficult territory. Rather than clear guidelines and complete shutdowns, yes or no, there were hundreds of decisions to be made in our daily lives and in our shared life as a community. Do we? Can we? How might we? Should we? Shouldn't we? And as quickly as the weather turned warm and things looked like they were approaching a new kind of normal, cases spiked, protocols reversed, and we were faced with the reality that we would be in this for a while longer. And then came Omicron. And as those numbers fall and daylight lengthens once again, and we again are wondering, dare we dream for a day when we are gathered fully again? Well, as my father used to say, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But last year was hard in lots of ways. Our young people are struggling with isolation and uncertainty. The political divisions in this country continue to push siblings in Christ to opposing corners, with compromise swiftly becoming a lost language or art. The hate and the fear which has lived under the skin of this country since its founding is erupting in episodes of violence against the historically marginalized. And closer to home, in this community, we have worked tirelessly to do what we can with the resources we have to make church happen in every way we could figure out how. Here in this building, in the community, online, and out in the world, we have worked tirelessly and many of us are tired. And we are sad. For this year, we lost a great deal in our lives, including several beloved members of our community. 
This year alone, since my last annual address with you, we have mourned the deaths of Laura Rutherford, Maureen Carter, Linda Hasty, Ken Carter, Tim O'Brien, and John Mahoney, and more. Not to mention our friends and family members not in this community. And so my colleague was right. 2021 was really, really, really hard. And yet, as I read the annual report, and yes, I read all 31 pages of it, and I ask you to do the same, I was reminded of how much growth new and continued also happened in and through this place in 2021. Sometimes these things happen despite the strange times in which we live, and sometimes they happened because of them. I could use the entirety of my annual address thanking all the people who helped make this past year possible, the staff, the vestry, your wardens, worship leaders, and ministry leaders, the list is very, very long. And of course, to begin to name a few is to ensure that I will forget some, though there will be time for some thank yous later this morning. Instead, I want to recall some memories that serve for me as illustrations of what has grown this past year in and through this community. Starting about this time of year, people love to post pictures of that first crocus flower peeking up through the snow as signs of new life emerging from the long winter. Well, the new image that I will use for that from now on in my own life is that of our choir standing outside in the snow to sing the foray requiem last year. They were like so many vocal crocuses, signaling new ways of bringing life into being. The continuing pandemic created the urgency for us to create the Circles of Caring Ministry. Every household in the congregation for whom we have contact information received a phone call or an email two times this past year. The image I use with the ministry team is to imagine they are leaving warm loaves of homemade baked bread on each doorstep. Whether or not they ever hear back, to be contacted and prayed for is to be loved. Love itself sprouted and grew here last year. Our racial justice ministry team was born out of a charge I issued in my last annual address to think of our racial justice work at St. Paul's not as a siloed ministry, but as a lens through which we would begin to see everything we do as a community of Jesus followers. That ministry is still growing and wrestling with what it all means. But that wrestling is the work, and I am grateful to those who have helped shape that conversation so far. We continue to put our faith into action, a core part of our identity here at St. Paul's. We still participated in the Be Safe Summer Camp program despite pandemic and tropical storms. We still gave out almost $35,000 in grants to 20 different community organizations through our Ministry Outside the Parish team. We held our most successful prison ministry book drive to date, filling the book requests for 45 incarcerated individuals. And while we now experience their loss, their absence as a loss to us, we helped make possible the expansion of the Brookline Food Pantry, which resulted in their securing larger, more accessible space for their operations at United Parish. The food pantry started at St. Paul's well over 30 years ago now with a couple of people 
and a really good idea. St. Paul shepherded that ministry through tremendous growth. We hired a program director as a member of the St. Paul staff. We then helped them to become an independent 501c3 so they could access new grant revenue. And we provided rent-free space for three decades until last year they filled every corner of the great hall, middle room, choir room, kitchen, and front lawn. A couple of people and a good idea by the grace of God is now feeding over 650 families per week. I wonder what a couple of people, a good idea, and the grace of God might do next here at St. Paul's. Never ask a question you don't at least know the answer to partially. <laughs> I know a little bit of what I hope God will do with a couple of people and a good idea. I know a couple of people thought it would be a good idea to join the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization to provide an opportunity and outlet for members of the St. Paul's community to effect change and pursue justice at the policy level and to become allies with communities of color throughout the greater Boston area. And as the ad goes, those few people told two friends and they told two friends and so on and so on and so on. We now have a vibrant GBIO at St. Paul's Ministry and the budget you have been presented includes in it for the first time, $6,000 from the operating fund allocated for our participation in GBIO. A couple of people thought it would be a good idea to get together and dream what the future of children, youth, young adult, and family ministries might look like at St. Paul's. They talked to two people and to groups of people to listen and discern a vision for the future of our ministry with the youngest among us. Their final report, available on our website, made it clear that in order to realize the potential of our ministry to children, youth, young adults, and families, we would need to commit substantial resources, financial and human, to support the work we believe can be done to realize this ministry's full potential. And so that same budget that you have before you, that your vestry has passed for 2021, in it we are committed to hiring a full-time assistant for children, youth, young adult, and family ministries. In fact, the job description went live online just this week, and my email box is filling with questions. Spread the word. And your response to these initiatives has been inspiring. You have vo volunteered to join the effort or to be interviewed. You've attended countless meetings and you have held it all in your prayer. And you have been generous. The response to this year's stewardship appeal has been remarkable. As we see a large increase in this year's budget due not only to these programmatic investments, but in uncontrollable expenses like utilities, you have responded generously and even sacrificially. Some of you have even revisited your pledge since you first made it and made further increases in hopes of making our mission and ministry possible in 2022. And I thank you. We are now just under $8,000 away from achieving our stretch goal of $400,000 in pledge. In the end of a second year of a pandemic, we are on track to grow our financial stewardship of St. Paul's 10% over our previous year. Who could possibly have imagined? Actually, you could. You did, and you are. I wonder again, what will a few people and a good idea and the Holy Spirit do next? 
Well, you will be hearing more about the exciting plans we have to replace our beloved but beleaguered Bozeman organ. There are plans to be made and funds to be raised, but I am confident come September and when we all walk back in through those doors, we will be greeted by an instrument up to the task before it to match the abundant gifts of our choir and their fearless and gifted leader. There will be much work to be done to welcome our new assistant for children, youth, young adult, and family ministries, and to ensure that they can be successful in their work by providing them all the love and support and prayers we can muster. And we are beginning to make plans for our middle room, the former site of the food pantry. We hope it will be a place of hospitality and welcome to the world to those needing a place to work or to rest or to get warm from the cold or cool from the heat. A place in which images of the church and of God represent the vast diversity of God's creation and beloved children. A place where the whole world will know that no matter who they are or where they come from, they will be welcome and they will be invited here. Please keep a lookout for more information about this initiative, which started as a few people with a good idea led by the grace of God. And this year, I want to ask each one of you to step forward. I want, to ask, I want you to ask yourself, how it is you might support our gathering as a community as we take more steps toward a new way of being together. It's been a while. We're a little out of practice. We sometimes forget we can't go get another cup of coffee in the middle of the sermon when Jeff drones on, <laughs> when we are actually now in the sanctuary. Well, you can, of course, but you can't turn your camera off when you do it. You can. And it takes a lot for us to be together, honestly. It actually takes more than it used to. We still need readers and ushers and greeters and altar guild members. We still need choir members and vergers and acolytes and coffee hour hosts. But we also now need tech people and social media hosts. It takes a lot for us to worship together and I hope you will pray seriously about what part you might take in it. Friends, I am ready to dream again of coffee hours and shared dinners. I'm ready to hope for chairs and pews that are filled and online streaming that continues to keep us accessible to those who cannot be here, even when the worst of this pandemic is over. I am ready with you to unwrap the unexpected gifts this time has given us, though we may not know yet anything about it. In her report on the gardens ministry, Julie Starr talks in it about the intense pruning that was done as part of the fall buildings and grounds work day. I told you I read your reports. <laughs> It was, I was there, a lot of pruning. And it wasn't done when pruning was supposed to be done, apparently, I learned. Julie writes in her report, quote, At the end of the day, when I looked at all the debris that was carted away, it made me wonder if anything was left. Two weeks later, the roses were leafing out, and four weeks later, they were blooming again. Rest assured, there will be a beautifully full garden in 2022." End quote. This time in our lives has felt like an abrupt, unwelcome, and untimely pruning. Some days, all it seems we can see are the empty spaces of what used to be but we are in a position to come back healthier, stronger, and more vibrant than ever. 
So rest assured, my friends, with your help and by God's grace, there will be a beautifully full garden in 2022, indeed. Amen.